Good evening and welcome to this evening's reading, part three of The Nail, when we're going to be hearing this evening from Pontius Pilate, having listened so far this week to Peter and the Roman centurion. So the format every evening is the same. We have two readings of scripture um, before we hear from Pontius Pilate, um, and then there'll be a prayer, and then we'll have some reflective music before we finish. So I think Anne's going to be leading off this evening with a reading. If you could unmute now, that would be lovely. Thank you very much. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law and according to that law, he ought to die because he claimed to be the son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered into his headquarters and again, he asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you're no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the stone pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was day of, day of the preparation of the Passover and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. And he handed him over to them to be crucified. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Many are those who would destroy me, my enemies who accuse me falsely. Truth, you'll forgive me if I don't join in the merriment. It's not as simple as you think. Very rarely black or white not as clear as you imagine, usually shades of grey that run into each other and collide. But truth itself, it is uncommon, elusive, like trying to establish and eat and catch the wind. That was Jesus's mistake. He saw it clearly, or rather, he thought he did. 
So take off your blinkers, stop pointing your finger at me, and consider one of the few bits of black and whiteness in this oh sorry episode. I tried to release him. I didn't want him killed, but it was what I had to do to keep the peace. The crowds had turned on him. There was no other choice. I actually quite liked the man. He had a certain steely coolness, not aloof, but assured. But it was uncomfortable. Everyone commented on it. My own wife told me to have nothing to do with the man, but to let him go. And as I said, that is what I wanted to do. But events got out of hand. The crowd got ugly. Everyone was screaming, crucify him, crucify him. This man they called their king. This man they had been so pleased to see. Do away with him, they shouted. Do your duty to Rome. He threatens your authority. Kill him. Even his own religious leaders were frightened of him. I could see that. But they were also frightened of what the crowd would say if they dealt with him themselves, which they could have done. He wouldn't be the first person they had stoned. But they wanted us to solve the problem. They wanted their own hands clean. What a joke. I can't believe I'm telling you this because I wanted my hands clean too. You see, this man disturbed me. And I gave him so many chances to evade the bait. But it was almost as if he was determined to die. It was as if he wanted the nails to pierce him. After a while, he barely even spoke to me, ignored my questions, spoke about a kingdom that was beyond the rule of Rome, and then shut up, condemned himself with this little strutting, flouting defiance. Because of course there is no kingdom. He had no power. His followers had left him. The crowd were baying for his blood. And in the end, I was the one trying to save him. Don't you understand that? I said to him plainly. Don't you know that I have the power to release you and the power to crush you? And he said, you've got to admire the impudence of the man. You would have no power unless it was given you from above. Though, as I say, it wasn't really impudence. And it almost certainly was more than defiance. It's a sort of madness. Only what disturbed me about this man most of all is that he wasn't mad. It was as if he had an inner something that sustained him propelled him, made him stand up to me, stand up to Rome, stand up to his own leaders so much 
but it was if he was embracing the cross that we had given him, holding it, as if he was not just doing it for himself. That's why I wanted to release him. This Barabbas, that the crown was sudden, the crowd was suddenly so keen to, to, to save, was a monster, a murderer, a menace. But he lives. And this Jesus, the King of the Jews, he dies. A plain sinner saved, a good man, a son of God, killed. What sense does that make? But I'm not going to be blamed for this. I spoke plainly. I find no case against him, I say. I let the crowds decide. I even called for a basin of water so that I could wash my hand in front of them. I am innocent of this man's blood, I say. And I walked away. What else could I have done? There would have been a riot. So, if you want a culprit, a scapegoat, if you want someone to say, look, it was me. I hammered the nails into his hands. I'm guilty. I killed him. Don't look at me. My hands are clean. Look at his own leaders. Look for the ones who handed him to me. They have the greater blame. They have the nails in their hands. Speak to Amas. Speak to the high priest, Caiaphas. He hated Jesus. It was his power that was threatened, not mine. Jesus was never going to topple Rome. But he might have shaken the ridiculous charade of their own religious posturing. I am innocent of this man's blood. Don't you understand? Innocent. Now, let me be. Leave me alone. Let us pray. Lord, when I take pride in my own cleanliness, and absent myself from consequences. When I sleep easy in my bed, disturb me. Show me where the hammer meets the mark. Wipe away conceit's veneer with the tears of the countless sorrowful, with the howling grief of the despairing dispossessed, with all the chickens home to roost and the mother hen destroyed. Show it to me clearly in the cold light of what has become of me, become because of me. Then open my heart to the wisdom of God and cleanse me from the inside out. Amen.
Hello. Thank you for joining us once again this evening. Um, we now continue next week on Monday evening when we'll be hearing from the High Priest Caiaphas. So do join us again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.